It is now our, uh, our great honor and privilege to recognize the pioneering work of Ray Ball and Phil Brown with the 2019 Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize for Quantitative Financial Innovation. The prize, which is given every two years, recognizes outstanding quantitative research that has contributed to a particular innovation in the practice of finance. It is accompanied by an $80,000 cash award and a sterling silver medal serving as an emblem of the prize and our recognition of groundbreaking research and advancement. In the 1960s, fellow Australians Ray Ball and Phil Brown joined for forces as PhD students at the University of Chicago. At the time, it was widely believed that accounting information uh, did not hold much value for investors, and Ball and Brown set out to challenge this. They began conducting an historical study around whether and how share prices react to information included in financial statements, as we've heard so much about today, and in doing so established what has developed into a burgeoning area of research on the informativeness of accounting figures in security returns, including an extensive literature on anomalies that many of, uh, many of us in this room have focused their careers in, uh, I would wager. Their work has ultimately, uh, was ultimately published in the Journal of Accounting Research in 1968. Fifty years later, the paper's impact is undeniable. Ray and Phil's groundbreaking research laid the foundation for many studies and articles to follow in accounting and finance and had significant influence on practice in both. Uh, in both, uh, in both. Uh, I would bet that many in this room actually grew up on Ball and Brown. Uh, in 2019, they published a replication to commemorate the anniversary of their 1968 paper. The article, titled Ball and Brown 1968 After 50 Years, can be found at the Pacific Basin uh, Finance Journal, and a link is also available on the Jacobs Levy Center website. Ray and Phil were selected for this year's prize by a committee of esteemed academics and practitioners who are listed in the award ceremony program. We are delighted to have Ray with us today to accept the award on behalf of both winners. He'll also present a reprise uh, and some observations on the prize-winning work that he and Phil prepared together for today's event. But first, we will hear from Bruce Jacobs and Ken Levy, whose generous gift endowed the Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize in 2011. Bruce also served as chair uh, of this year's selection committee. It is especially appropriate to hear from Bruce and Ken because they were also among the earliest authors who, in their own groundbreaking research, contribute to the line of work so eminently established by Ball and Brown. Please join me in again welcoming Bruce and Ken. Thank you, Chris, for those kind remarks. You know, amazing things happen when the right people get together in the right place at the right time. Ray Ball and Phil Brown were the right people. They met at the University of New South Wales in the 1960s. Phil left Australia in 63 to study as a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Chicago. There he earned his MBA and PhD, becoming an assistant professor at Chicago's Graduate School of Business. Meanwhile, Ray earned his Fulbright Scholarship and at Phil's urging, also enrolled at Chicago, where he also earned an MBA and PhD and is today the Sidney Davidson Distinguished Service Professor of Accounting. Phil ultimately went on to the University of Western Australia, where today he's a senior honorary research fellow in accounting and finance and a professor emeritus. And Chicago was the right place. As Ray and Phil point out in their article, Ball and Brown, 1968, After 50 Years, the University of Chicago was a place where all ideas were viewed as candidates for challenge with alternative arguments and with data. It was also the right time, the dawn of the computer age. The CRISP database had become available at the University of Chicago in 1964, two years after Standard & Poor released the CompuStat database. These databases constituted a mere fraction of the data available to analysts today, but Ray and Phil made the most of what they had. The research was first presented in the November 1967 Seminar on the Analysis of Security Prices at the University of Chicago. Their seminal paper, An Empirical Evaluation of Accounting Income Numbers, was published a year later in the Journal of Accounting Research. It focused on the relationship between accounting earnings and subsequent changes in stock prices, 
they found that contrary to the prevailing academic view at the time, accounting earnings were relevant for investors, thus beginning to bridge academia and practice. As important as the findings of the paper was the approach Ray and Phil took. Their aim, as they noted in After 50 Years, was to confront the accounting literature's central ideas with systematic as opposed to anecdotal evidence. Theirs was the first published event study using earnings data. As Ray and Phil stated, their paper paved the way for an entirely new, robust, and still expanding evidence-based accounting literature. The importance of the paper's contribution to accounting has been recognized by Ray and Phil's respective inductions into the American Accounting Association Hall of Fame and the Australian Accounting Hall of Fame. An empirical evaluation of accounting income numbers opened another research door, one that's had a particular impact on investing and led to much fruitful investigation and practice in the many years since its publication. It's finding that abnormal returns continued in the expected direction even after the announcement of earnings the so-called post-earnings announcement drift was the first reported evidence of anomalous behavior in the context of the efficient market hypothesis. The Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize for Quantitative Financial Innovation recognizes outstanding quantitative research that has contributed to an important innovation in the practice of finance. Ray Ball and Phil Brown's Seminal research on earnings announcements and stock prices certainly fits that bill. It ignited a revolution in accounting research, opening the door to new methods of conducting empirical research in finance and ultimately innovations in the practice of finance. Ray and Phil's path to innovation followed a classical template. First, they challenged conventional wisdom. As they describe it, the thinking at the time was that financial statements prepared under existing accounting standards are completely devoid of meaning. This embrace of accounting nihilism reflected the great disparity in the accounting methods used. Theorist R.J. Chambers, in an academic paper from the 1960s, calculated a single set of organizational transactions could give rise to some 30 million different profit figures. Confronted by the seeming futility of their chosen profession, Ray and Phil asked themselves, why do firms put so many resources into calculating net income and preparing balance sheets if they're meaningless? Second, Ray and Phil set out to answer this question using the latest available methods and tools to determine whether accounting information, in particular earnings, were important to investors. They exploited an emergent technique in finance, the event study, and data that had just become available thanks to the CRISP and CompuStat databases. To crunch the data, they took over the University of Chicago's computer, an IBM 7094. It was a behemoth in terms of size, but diminutive in terms of today's computers. With a memory only 1 16 millionth the size of an Apple iPhone's. Their findings were revolutionary. Earnings and stock prices were most definitely correlated. While stock prices generally anticipated earnings announcements, they continued to be affected after the announcement, providing investors with an opportunity 
to use earnings data to forecast future returns. Third, as with so many innovations, Ray and Phil's 1968 paper faced rejection before it gained acceptance. The accounting review rejected it partly because the editors felt it had little to do with accounting. After its publication in the Journal of Accounting Research, the article met with some vitriolic reactions. The typical finance academic continued to believe the accounting numbers were meaningless. However, Ray and Phil had started the revolution. New generations of accounting and finance scholars came to appreciate the discipline of Ray and Phil's approach and the new research tools they had harnessed. We are proud to award the 2019 Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize for Quantitative Financial Innovation to Ray Ball and Phil Brown in recognition of their transformative accomplishment. Thank you for your contributions and a hearty congratulations. Ray, please join us now to accept the award on behalf of yourself and Phil, who isn't able to be with us today. Ray, it's an honor to present you the Jacobs Levy Prize Medal. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. It's on behalf of both Phil and myself that I say it's such a great honor to receive this prize. Um, we thank the uh, Jacobs Levy Center for holding this conference and especially for the award. Um, we thank Bruce Jacobs and Ken Levy for their extraordinary generosity in sponsoring the center that bears their name as well as this award. Uh, and finally, we, uh, we thank the prize selection committee for their outstanding judgment. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a great pity that Philip can't be here due to a health condition that prohibits him from, uh, from flying. Uh, he's in Perth, which is on the west coast of Australia and we're on the east coast of the United States. It is actually 11,800 miles from one place to the other, which is about as far away as you can get from any two places on Earth. Uh, and so air travel from there to here is out for him. Um, but he and I think a lot uh, on most matters. Uh, and we both worked on the slide presentation that I'm about to deliver. Uh, so I trust that what I'm about to say fairly reflects both of our views, OK? So here's the. What I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about some of the background, we'll talk about our principal research design choices, some results, then the replication, which I think is a bit more interesting than the rest of it, uh, and then I'll summarize some certain things. So this is Philip and myself, uh, six months ago in Melbourne. Um, I just got off the plane, I'm jet lagged, and <laughs> so I'm looking a bit scruffy. We're having a cup of coffee together. Uh, and at the end, I'll show you what we looked like 50 years ago. <laughs> it's a bit different. <laughs> So um, Bruce and Ken have already said this pretty much. Um, if you go back and look at the accounting liter literature circa 1967, it's pretty bad. It's interesting to actually look at the finance literature <laughs> uh, at that time. Uh, the Journal of Finance started, I think, in 1945. And you read the first 20 years of it, apart from a small number of articles, it really, by today's standards, is, is very rudimentary. Um, and um, yeah, in the accounting literature, the prevailing view was that the numbers were totally useless. Um, so that's part of the background. Okay? So we arrived at Chicago, I feel a couple of years before me, uh, and there were these ideas floating around that had gone back to the 30s in Chicago by some of the giants of economics. Uh, and one of the very important beliefs was that if you don't put up barriers in markets, if you let markets do their own thing, okay? Uh, 
And I don't mean just capital markets, I mean product markets, labor markets, whatever. Uh, that uh, there's a relentless pressure towards more efficient economic institutions. So you know, Amazon finds a more efficient way of delivering a number of things to us other than us uh, getting in a vehicle and going to a department store, looking around in the department store. It's, they, they win, okay? So in the absence of restrictions, inefficiency doesn't survive, okay? And I think, as, as Ken said, the uh, culture at Chicago at the time was everything is up for grabs. Uh, and I must say the school backed that, uh, which now Morton is doing and the Jacobs Levy Center is doing, the school backed it with resources. So in 1960, uh, the school invested a fairly large amount of money with support from Merrill Lynch uh, to uh, build the CRSP file. Uh, it was a very far uh, looking, forward looking uh, thing. Uh, and so the school backed ideas with resources, okay? And so Phil and I put these two sorts of ideas together and thought they didn't jibe. And if, the, if you know, we put so many resources into preparing financial statements and auditing them, and analysts spend so much time on them, it would be hard to justify those resources continuing to go into financial reporting and analysis if it's all meaningless. It just did not make sense whatsoever. A little bit by way of background. Uh, this is just a very qualitative walk through some of the ideas that have floated around some of the presentations today. Earnings and returns. So they might seem like completely different concepts. Earnings are calculated by accountants using accounting rules. Returns occur in the stock market by people voluntarily trading buying and selling stock, okay? But they're actually closely related economic variables. First of all, over the life of the company, they're identical. Okay, over the life of the company, if we look at stock returns, there is contributed capital goes into the company, there's cash goes in. At the end of the life of the company, there's an amount of cash distribution that's gone out, and the difference between the two is equal to total return, and the difference between the two is actually also equal to total earnings. Why is that? Well, in terms of returns, if you think of the first day of the existence of a, a stock when it goes public, there's cash that's gone into it, there's a closing price. But that closing price disappears in the return sequence, the next observation, when it becomes, in the denominator, the opening price. And so the price is just linked together over time, and over time they go out of the system, and there's cash in and cash out is what determines total stock return. The equivalent in accounting is what links them is balance sheets, balance sheet book value of equity. Okay? But once again, uh, the closing, the first uh, observation, you've got a closing balance sheet, it becomes the opening balance sheet for the next year. And so over time, they're equal. Okay? What they differ in is when they incorporate cash flow news. Okay? So they're both equal to some difference between cash in and cash out over the life of the, the company but they differ in when that gets incorporated. So uh, returns incorporate considerable or under the efficient market hypothesis, all of the information available about expected cash flows. Earnings incorporate realized ex post cash flow with some adjustments via accounting accruals, okay? And some of those accounting accruals anticipate future cash flows. What do I mean by that? Uh, if uh, a firm uh, sells uh, merchandise on credit, uh, accountants don't take the cash collections and simply book that into the earnings, they, they book uh, credit sales with some allowance for uncollectibles, okay, and that cash gets collected in the next observation. So what accountants do is in a very conservative fashion, they do some of the same anticipation that the stock market does, but they basically anticipate what is auditable and accountants are conservatively prepared to put into the earnings number. But the point being that while returns therefore lead earnings because the stock market looks further ahead and is less conservative than the accounting profession, while returns lead earnings, in the long term they converge. Okay? And ultimately, the only way a firm adds any value is by generating earnings. That's the only thing in the long term that occurs. Okay? So let me then talk about Farmer Fisher Jensen and Roll. This was a paper published in 1969. Ours was published in 68. But uh, while we had struggles to get ours published, they had even greater struggles. <laughs> and their paper had preceded us by several years. Okay? And I want to point out 
or, or try and convince you why I think this was one of the most important graphs in the history of asset management. Okay? So let me try and describe it the following way. Um, without any way of systematically looking at how the share market responds to information, the lay view of it is one picks up, say, the Wall Street Journal, and as you know, that only reports the tip of the iceberg of the information events on a particular day. Okay? But in a lay perspective, what one tends to do is view the share market in a particular calendar day, responding to a whole cross-section of events that occur that day. They range from some of the stuff that's going on in Washington, some of the stuff that's going on in Europe, some of the stuff that's going on in Southeast Asia and Middle East, okay? uh, all the way through to what the Fed is doing, uh, various aggregate uh, data, industry data, at a firm level, new products, change in product price, maybe a management change, what, there's a lot of stuff goes on. And the lay perspective is to look in calendar time at a cross-section of events. And what you see is chaos. You, you can't connect them. There's no systematic view, okay? And so what Farmer Fisher Jensen and Roll did is they flipped it exactly on its head. They looked at one event, not a cross-section of events, that occurs at a cross-section of times and not the same time. So they said, let's take when a company splits its stock. Let's take that as the event and will line up its share price behavior relative to the time of that event. And suddenly, we see systematic behavior. In that graph we see before, the vertical line in the middle is the, the date of the stock split. Okay, the dotted line is price behavior. And what you see is this systematic behavior of the price anticipating in advance the event, which is the stock split. And it's relatively flat thereafter, which is what it's supposed to be in an efficient market. Okay. But the key thing about it is two things. The first is that Gene Farmer in 1965 had written, by the way, I revere Gene Farmer, it should become pretty clear. Okay? Uh, in 1965, he had written a piece which is known, I think, incorrectly for first mentioning the words efficient market. But the key contribution to that piece is modeling price behavior as a function of information flows. And if you look at all of the research that had been done on stock prices before that date, it was all statistical analysis, like whether or not there are sequences in prices, and it was done by statisticians and not by financial economists, okay? And so, and the idea that information was an important good was very novel at the time. In fact, George Stickler at Chicago had published a piece in 1961 in the Journal of Political Economy saying, Economy, you shouldn't have to convince academics that information is a good, is an economic good, but it plays almost no role in our literature. Okay? And there's some work being done by guys like Roy Radner and so forth, but information was not the way flows were not the way we looked at share prices. So this graph did two things. First of all, it, it showed the, it confirmed the value of looking at share price behavior as a function of information flows. And secondly, there was something systematic, okay? And I can attest to you that as a young doctoral student, I got the opportunity to show that graph to finance professors both in the United States and in my home country, Australia, and they were astonished, okay? They did not believe that there would be systematic behavior in the stock market. So I don't think I exaggerate when I say this underpins a lot of what the people in this room do because what you are all doing is looking for systematic behavior in the stock market, okay? So while Gene Farmer's 65 paper introduced the notion of stock prices responding to information, it all, and he talked about efficiency, that becomes a lot of the foundation for a lot of the behavioral theories. In other words, are we rational Bayesians in how we, we respond to information? Do we overreact or do we underreact? Okay? So we had, as in the Ball Brown paper, we had the, uh, a natural design that would allow us to try and attack this issue as to whether or not accounting numbers are meaningless and find something more about the relationship between accounting earnings and share prices. Okay? So we had to make some research design choices. Odd as it might seem, <laughs> we had to figure out what the, what the event was, what was the information event. Farmer Fisher Jensen Roll, as you announce a stock split. Well, the fact you announce your earnings is not a surprise. <laughs> You're required to announce your earnings. Okay? Uh, and this is one of the differences between discretionary and non-discretionary disclosure in the markets and how they respond, okay? Uh, 
So we, we had to figure out, okay, what's going to be the, the event? Well, we hit upon the notion of what we called unexpected earnings, now known as earnings news or earnings surprise, okay? And we measured it in a couple of different ways, okay? We uh, collected earnings announcement dates. Uh, uh, the major reason I wear gla glasses is that I almost went blind reading microfiche <laughs> of Wall Street, Journal, uh, Wall Street Journals going back uh, you know, 10 years. Uh, we, so we hand collected earnings announcement date. If you look at the paper, it's pretty crude by today's standards. We have very simple non-parametric statistics. First of all, Gene Farmer had scared us off parametric statistics by his his uh, argument that uh, stock prices, uh, stock returns had infinite variances, so-called stable operations. Um, uh, and we also thought that there'd be a non-linear relation, so we used non-parametric stats. It was a tiny sample by today's standards, uh, 2,340 observations. People now routinely have a couple of hundred thousand uh, earnings announcement observations, okay? Uh, and uh, as previously mentioned, we did the calculations on an IBM 7040, uh, 7094 that was scheduled by an IBM 7040. Uh, it was really wild because this was the computer at the University of Chicago, and I want to build upon this in a second. It was the computer at the University of Chicago. It operated in batch processing, so when we were running a job, there was no one else in the entire university running a job on computing, okay? Uh, and some of our jobs took, because we had large data files, took quite a while, and some of the physicists would get really angry at us because we were holding them up. Their jobs were stacked up in the queue, okay? But the reason I talk about this, in part, is that one of the themes today that in the discussions in the papers has been whether or not results replicate over time, okay? I would be very surprised if you could not find, in hindsight, a large number of anomalies on old data. The metaphor I always use in this, talking to my students, is that if you had a helicopter gun shop, a gun, gun, sorry, a helicopter gun ship in the Middle Ages, you would have run the world, right? If you took today's computers and if you had them in 1930, <laughs> you'd have done very, very well analyzing the data, okay? And so using today's computing power, going back and looking at old data, I think is not surprising that one would find large numbers of anomalies. And one would not be surprised to find that many of them go away over time, okay? So this is the first result we had. This was a reporting lag, um, uh, the difference between the data which, uh, the, the balance date, and then the, the date at which the first announcement occurred in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, by the way, there was no internet then, so the announcements were on the Wall Street Journal. Um, that was the first time they came out. Um, and uh, we can see that it looks like they declined over time um, from 57 to 65. This was a graph that we reported, I'll, I'll jump uh, ahead to a more recent version of it in a second, but that's become a sort of pretty well-known graph in accounting, okay? So we decided, well, we were asked to replicate it. The Pacific Basin Finance Journal, why that? Well, uh, Phil is still in Australia. I grew up in Australia, and it was in the Pacific Basin, and, and so they asked us, would we replicate the study with a particular emphasis, not just on replicating it in more recent times, but in a number of countries with an emphasis upon Pacific Basin countries. So I'm going to talk about this for a little bit, okay? So here we have daily data. Um, this is a much larger number of firms, and since it's daily data and not monthly data, a lot more observations, and we're going to be running it in 17 countries. And I should point out that, that Phil is a data nut, uh, and he likes to process the largest amount of data he can in the smallest computer that he can find, <laughs> find ways of doing it. Uh, and uh, it's a trait we learn from having to squeeze everything into an IBM 7094 with only 32K of addressable memory. Phil's still trying to do that uh, <laughs> in a greater scale. Um, and so what are the results? The first result is known in accounting as value relevance. That is, what we find is an association between the sign of an annual earnings change and annual returns. So in this graph, the, uh, the green uh, graph at the top uh, is companies which at the vertical line in the middle, the dotted line, uh, companies that announced their earnings on day zero and the earnings were good news relative to last year's. This is a simple we had different ways of doing it, but a simple 
model. Turns out to work pretty well. Viewing earnings change as the surprise. So green is earnings up on last year. Okay, red is earnings down on last year. And the value relevance is well, we see that the sign in which the, uh, by the way, the vertical axis, we call it an abnormal performance index. Uh, 0.10 is 10%, 0 0.15 is 15%, minus 0 0.10 is minus 10%. So what you see is an association between the signs of the earnings surprise and the price movement. Okay? Believe me, that was shocking to people to see that in retrospect, uh, it's pretty obvious. Okay? But that goes back to the notion that annual returns and annual earnings incorporate overlapping information. Over the life of the firm, perfectly overlaps. Over a year, there's a fair amount of overlap. Okay? The second result is low timeliness. Prices really lead earnings by a substantial margin. You can see the price movements occur well before that vertical dotted line when the earnings announcement comes out. Okay? And as part of that, if you look at the dotted line at the event day zero, you see there are little blips. Okay? So yes, there's some reaction at the event date, but it's not much. Okay? Uh, in the scheme of things, it's there, but in the scheme of things, most of what is uh, reported in a earnings number is old news. Okay? Well, why is that? Well, that makes perfect sense. What, what do accountants do? Um, once a quarter, they sharpen their pencils, and they do some sums. Uh, they add up all of your revenues from the last quarter. They add up all your expenses. They calculate an earnings number. They report it maybe two, three weeks into the next quarter. Okay, but the revenues that they are reporting started at the beginning of the last quarter. And so they're talking, they're giving you information that starts out being 15, 16 weeks late. Okay, there are some events that occur right toward the end of a quarter that are not known to the market, they get into the income numbers. But accountants are very good at looking backwards. Okay, there are some old jokes about that. Uh, uh, but in the interests of your sanity this afternoon, I won't say them. Uh, but uh, yeah, so. What we find is there's low timeliness, prices lead earnings. That tells us something about the economic role of financial reporting. Most of the role of, of an earnings number is actually telling people what happened and confirming what happened. Just accounting is counting. So uh, one of the pieces of research that has followed up on this is to ask the question, do, does an audited financial number that comes out confirm prior disclosures made by managers and make those managers more truthful, those disclosures more truthful, okay? So yeah, that, that's something, we learned something about accounting, okay? We also learned something about markets that I previously mentioned. We called it the drift. The accounting literature then called it the post-earnings announcement drift. It's the first reported anomaly. Now I now have a dis version of SP's disclaimer to read out. I disclaim all responsibility for the remaining 539 anomalies that have been reported since. <laughs> okay. So um, here in the replication gives us the reporting lags in calendar days by year in the United States. Okay. And so we can see that they're pretty flat except for the top uh, line, which is the 99th percentile. And they appear to be getting shamed into being more timely, uh, but it turns out this is very misleading because there are two things going on. If you look at the reporting lags where you require the firm to be uh, the same firm this year as last year, okay, then the reporting lags of comparable firms one year to the next decline every single year. Okay. The second thing that's going on is there are new firms coming into the market which tend to be younger and take longer to report. And so the older firms that remain in the market are gradually getting their act together more and more quickly, okay? And, but the market is having new firms come on who report later, okay? In the accounting literature, people get exercised about the amount of variation in stock returns that can be explained by earnings numbers. I've never really fully understood why this is an important issue, but accounting literature gets exercised by it, and it has declined over time. Okay? It's sort of like a measure of accountant's market share in terms of informing the share market. So if you ask yourself what the R squared is between annual earnings and annual returns, 
you're asking yourself the question, how much of the information in the stock return is captured in the annual earnings number? Right? And the rest that isn't is due to other information sources. So the R squared is sort of like a market share for accountants. But the interesting thing about it is as a metric, it assumes that the market knows this stuff already. And so it, as far as a market's concerned, it's not interested in that R squared, but the accounting profession is interested in it. And this is a non-parametric version of, of that, uh, and it's declined over time. Okay? How do we calculate it here? We have this measure AI, we call it, and another one NI. Okay? What is AI? All information. Okay? Sorry, accounting information. Okay? So we ask ourselves the question, suppose we told you a year in advance okay, whether the earnings of the firm were going to be up or whether they are going to be down, and you took equal weighted long-short positions where you went long on the earnings up, short on earnings down. Okay? And that's a measure of the value of advanced information about earnings. Suppose at the same time a year in advance we told you what the price was going to be at the earnings announcement date. Then you went long on the price increase and short on the price decrease, equal weighted. It turns out in our, in our data, uh, that number was about 50%. The accounting, the, the value of perfect information about earnings, sign, was about 50% of the value of perfect information about whether the price would go up or go down. That has declined over time, that ratio. Okay? So that's about the only thing that doesn't replicate. We then uh, replicated in 16 other countries. We've got countries in, in question mark to avoid sensitivity of calling Taiwan, uh, putting it in the same group. Uh, the results replicate well. Uh, they're fairly compelling evidence that the initial result was robust. Okay. And I should point out, if we go back to this graph, this is a result that is published 50 years after the, we published the initial result. And publication does not appear to have traded it out of the market. Okay? So there's an argument that once something gets published, it goes out of the market. This graph looks remarkably similar to the graph we reported 50 years before. Okay? Uh, so it's 50 years since we reported it. And it's actually 40 years since I am, I am guilty. At, I wrote a paper in 78 in the Journal of Financial Economics introducing the word anomaly to the literature uh, and summarizing all of this sorts of uh, uh, evidence. So it's 50 years since we reported it. It's 40 years since I published a piece that said that this is systematic. It's beginning to show up in a lot of other studies and it's still there. Okay? So the, the hypothesis that it gets traded out of the market, yeah, it might be disappearing a bit now, but boy, that means it's taken a long, long time to trade it out of the market. So I'm skeptical about whether that's what's going on. So let's go then to the international scene, okay? So the, pre, the, the good news, bad news separation in prices over the year, where one goes up and goes down, okay, is positive and statistically significant in all of the 16 countries. Okay, the gap is about 15 to 25%. Uh, it's remarkably low variance. What do I mean by that? That's the difference between the, the, val the value of perfect information a year in advance of the fact that the firm will have an earnings increase or an earnings decrease. Okay? It's um, about 15 to 25%. Uh, significant in every one of the 16 countries. The event day responses uh, are positive uh, and significant in 14 of the 16 countries. Okay. The magnitudes are small. Remember, we only saw small blips at the event date. And that's why it's harder to get statistical significance in some of the countries with small sample sizes. Uh, but the event date is separation is significant in 14 of the six. It's positive in all of them, but significant only in 14. The price earnings announcement drift is there in all of the 16 countries and significant in 15 of the 16. Okay. So it doesn't look a whole lot like data mining or the, of, of an anomaly that's going to be traded out of the market. Okay? So these are the results uh, that back up that summary. Uh, on the right-hand column, uh, highlighted in red, uh, is the uh, post-earnings announcement drift. It's the, the amount of money that you make with an equal-weighted uh, strategy where you went long at the earnings announcement date on companies that had announced an increase in earnings and go short at the earnings announcement date on companies that that day 
showed a decrease in earnings and hold their position for half a year, for 180 days. Okay? So it's a long, short position on, long, on good news versus bad news in earnings. Uh, and those numbers are positive, uh, as I said, in 16 out of 16, and significant, I think, in 15 out of 16. Okay? So to give you an idea of some of the graphs, here's Australia and Japan. Okay? Uh, there's Korea and Malaysia. Um, uh, and so the results replicate. Okay? We documented the mapping of returns into earnings over the year. You might notice I called returns change in market value of equity. So stock returns are just change in market value of equity adjusted for dividends and capital contributions scaled by opening value. Okay? Cha earnings really are change in book value of equity adjusted for dividends and capital contributions. That's what they are. The only things that change book value of equity are capital contributions, you know, positive or negative, dividends and earnings. Okay? So we documented that mapping. Uh, we revealed two important properties we believe of accounting earnings. Yes, it's value relevant. It picks up uh, the same sort of information that stock returns do. It's not very timely. Okay? We also just didn't view earnings as simply another information signal. By relating it to value changes in the market okay, and not just looking at things like stock turnover, we're learning something about accounting. Okay? Um, it provided new views. Uh, we used this data to test notions of optimal accounting regimes. What do I mean by that? It's now called evidence-based policy research. In the days in which the literature said the accounting numbers are meaningless, there were enormous calls for reform, for accounting to just throw out as accounting as it now exists, throw away all the accounting standards, and replace them with some version of current market prices. Okay. Uh, and so this was an example of evidence-based policy research. We were saying, okay, well, it's, it's the, old si the system we've got doesn't look so bad. If it's not that bad, is there such a strong case to overturn it? Okay? Uh, another strength that replicated, uh, we acknowledged the first anomaly. I'm embarrassed to say that when I was doing that survey I published in 78, there were a couple of papers that I did not include because it turns out they stop reporting what went on after time zero. <laughs> and the reason is typically when you've got an hypothesis or a theory as a scientist, and the theory here was efficient markets, that it should all stop, the movements should all stop at time zero. If it doesn't stop, you view the failure as failure of yourself, the scientist. Okay? So people stop reporting <laughs> the, uh, some of the anomalies. I think that was a shame. Uh, so we're proud of the fact that we acknowledged it. It was a short paper, carefully written. Uh, we had to write it carefully because we realized a few people would understand it, <laughs> and, uh, so, especially in accounting. Weaknesses, tiny sample. There's a survivor bias. The CompuStat file we had was prepared for, for people in practice, and people in practice are not inter were then not, in no, it's mainly stockbrokers. They were not interested in unlisted firms. Okay, that had been not, that had been delisted, and so they took currently listed firms and backfilled it. Okay, so there was a survivor bias in CompuStat. We had only monthly data. We ignored cross-sectional correlation. Uh, we couldn't study the market component of earnings. We've got this earnings surprise variable uh, was just the naive random walk, but it turns out that model works pretty well. There's research that shows that forecasting next year's earnings as being equal to this year's earnings. A year ahead does about as well as security analysts a year ahead. There's not a whole lot of difference in, the, in between them. Uh, we use simple test statistics. And this research, my, if I had a student to put a piece of research up like that now, they'd be failed. Okay? It wouldn't pass muster now. So, so, because pays to go first. So the outcome, yeah, uh, I think Bruce mentioned the accounting review rejected it. Um, uh, the Journal of Accounting Research, things were raw in those days. So Nick Dopich was the editor. He said, I didn't understand the paper. I didn't know. This is new stuff. I, didn't I had no understanding of it. I think Gene Farmer liked it, so I accepted it. <laughs> um, so eventually, the results spoke for themselves. Um, uh, and the last point I've got down there is one of the very, very pleasing themes of today's uh, conference is the number of people who are digging into the details of financial reporting and understanding financial statements better and realizing that you don't take accounting numbers at face value, you have to interpret them, and there's a lot more in them 
than meets the eye by just simply looking at some bottom line numbers. Uh, and so that's a very, very pleasing development. So let me finalize by saying um, uh, so these are some of the outcomes. Uh, uh, it's difficult to measure the impact on practice. I mean, there's correlation versus causation. We can't say that we caused all the, this stuff to happen. Knowing the relation between earnings and prices helps an active investor frame the, the, the validity of their investment thesis. And I see that a lot. I sit on a board of a mutual fund and we, we have managers and analysts who come in and one of the things they want to calibrate is if they have some, an idea as to something that's not been priced into the market, okay? One of the ways to calibrate it to see whether it really is a, an idea that's unique to them is to work out the earnings implications of that idea and then we'll look at the price earnings ratio implied by that and ask the question, does this look like the market already knows this idea or not? Uh, I suspect that would have happened independently of us, but I think we might help people to frame it a little bit better by seeing more systematically what the relation between earnings and prices are. Um, I think that this and an enormous amount of literature that has followed in the same vein uh, underpins the secular move to passive investing. In other words, it's not a matter of just looking at public information and, and trading on it. You ha actually have to be better than the market to beat the market. So in terms of earnings, to do well, you don't have to, there's not enough to be a good forecaster of earnings. You've got to be a better forecaster of earnings than the market. And we saw the evidence that the market anticipates fairly well. Um, there's now a mini industry. We, we had to invent this idea of unexpected earnings. This would have happened anyway, but there's now a mini industry reporting consensus forecasts and earnings surprises. It didn't exist back then. Uh, some quant managers tilt their portfolios towards earnings variables, operating profitability, uh, gross profitability, whatever, um, and unfortunately anomaly chasing. I call them, you know, after ambulance chasers, uh, anomaly chasers abound, okay? So we were younger then. <laughs> I was 23 and Phil was 28. So thank you. Okay. Let's go ahead and take some questions. Yeah, I was, I was able to uh, look at your uh, paper on the 50 years revisited and the one thing about the other countries um, that I picked up on and I don't know if you want to elaborate it seemed like the accounting information in China uh, seemed to be higher than some of the other countries in the Pacific Basin and it was approaching 40 or 48 percent of the explanation of the price movement and some of the intuition in the market is uh, from the US-based bias is that Chinese accounting uh, standards aren't as rigorous as US standards and, and that sometimes the numbers are manipulated. So I don't know if you can elaborate on that. And there was also an anomaly based also, I think, on some of the South Korea numbers too. All right. So I, I agree with your, your premise about uh, accounting standards around the world. Um, uh, but I think the big difference is in enforcement of the accounting standards, and there are some f regimes where not only is enforcement weak, but there are strong incentives to have weak enforcement. Uh, so there's no doubt whatsoever that the quality of the accounting numbers varies around the world. Uh, I don't want to point my finger specifically at China, but you know, obviously there's a lot of press on, on that, but it, the quality of the accounting numbers does vary a lot around the world. One of the things that we have to bear in mind is that wherever you are in the market, people like to make money, okay? Uh, and if they like to make money, what they will try and do, if the accounting numbers are not such a high quality, is they'll try to find out something about the value of the firm by other ways. Some legal, some not legal. Some ethical, some not ethical. So what has surprised me over time is how in some of the lesser developed markets, how similar the results look to what we got. To put a sharp point on it, uh, so uh, uh, in 1969, Phil returned to Chicago, I returned, uh, to Australia. Uh, I returned for, and stayed. I returned for a while in, in 72, for 14 years. And one of the first things that he did when he got back was he started putting together the Australian version of the CRSP file. Um, and when I got back, I started putting together uh, a, a CompuStat type file. Um, but Phil published a, 
piece called Those Half Yearly Reports, I think it was, something like that. Uh, uh, soon after he got back and he showed similar results in Australia than in the US. And people said to him, oh no, what you see in a big market like New York won't apply here on the Sydney Stock Exchange where there's much less turnover, the company's a lot smaller, there's less liquidity. Well, the same sort of results uh, apply. Then uh, I think it was a guy called David Emanuel, I think uh, in New Zealand saw the Australian results and so he said, okay, I'll collect some data in New Zealand. New Zealand's a country where there are something like about 10 times more sheep than people, okay? <laughs> it's not a large country. I think it's got a population of about 4 million, something like that, okay? And so the people in New Zealand said, oh, what you see in Australia, in a big country like Australia, you won't see here. Guess what? The results came up the same way. Um, the joke was, hey, is someone going to be doing this in Tonga? <laughs> it's, that was the joke that was floating around. Okay? Um, so, I, in, answer your question, yes, accounting quality does vary a lot around the world, but there are real incentives for people to try and get around that. Uh, and I have been really surprised by uh, how the results do replicate in some of the lesser developed countries. Now, bear in mind, these, these are gross results. I should have apologized on that. This, um, we're talking about a 50-year-old paper and replicating this research design. This is not where we're running sort of very sophisticated farmer French models or whatever, okay? Re, re, uh, farmer Macbeth regression. So um, I suspect that if you modified this research design to be more sensitive to those sorts of issues, you'd be able to find differences. Yeah, um, it's an honor to have you here. And uh, I just had a you know, non-technical, but rather a personal question. Um, I mean, when your paper was first rejected, I mean, how did you feel and how did you two kind of respond to it and kind of overcame that? I mean... <laughs> well, we were sort of shattered. Uh, and, you know, bear in mind, I was 23. And uh, I'm thinking, my God, is my career over? Am I going to have to go home to, go home to Sydney? <laughs> uh, our idea is going to be rejected. And so... Um, Philip had uh, just joined the faculty, uh, and so he had access to a telephone. Uh, in those days, it seems hard to, you, you wouldn't understand it unless you're my age. Uh, long distance calls were very expensive, and you had to get the dean's approval as a faculty member to make a long distance call. So Phil got the dean's approval to call uh, Charlie Griffin, who was the editor of the accounting review. Uh, and, the conversation was really sort of bizarre. Uh, uh, Charlie said, oh, um, uh, I've, I've got a friend who's an econometrician and he told me what a regression is and it's got nothing to do with accounting. <laughs> and uh, it's like, whoa, okay. Uh, and he said, but do you know what? I like the front end when you're arguing about what's wrong with the existing literature. If you throw away all the data, I'll publish the front end. <laughs> And then we realized the problem we had. <laughs> that was like, uh, so, um, uh, no, Nick Topic saved us. Um, uh, the, you know, if Nick Topic hadn't saved the paper, it would have probably ruined my life. But uh, someone else would have done it a few years later anyway. So, um, but, yeah, that, it, it wasn't very pleasant <laughs> at the time. Ray, thank you so much for your reprise and for all your good work. Thank you. <laughs>